So now we have come to considering the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent is a reforming council uh, for the Roman Catholic Church that meets three different times between the period of 1545 and 1563. It might be a surprise to look at the initial date for this council, 1545, and consider that certainly by 1520, one knew that there was a significant issue to address um, in the movement around Martin Luther. So why does it take 25 years for this council to be called? Some of the issues here rest with um, the papacy's own reluctance to call the council out of a fear of conciliarism. Remember, conciliarism uh, is an ideal that was expressed in the 14th and 15th centuries that the ultimate authority of the church rests not in the Pope alone, but in ecumenical or universal councils of the church. And so the papacy is concerned that if uh, a council is to be called, that this might challenge papal authority and was developed as a sort of papal monarchy um, with the emergence of a new conciliar or constitutional system. So there's this continual effort to assure the papacy that uh, if any kind of council is called to address this crisis, that the papacy itself will be able to control the outcome of it. You might even recall that in Luther's earliest writings, he states over and over, if the Pope would just call a council of the church, we could work all these matters out. And so it's worth considering the road not taken. Well, if a council had been called in 1520, instead of what emerges after that. Another issue at play here is what sort of council would this be? Would it be a council that would affirm traditional church teaching? Would it address the various kinds of demands for reform that are being heard in various kinds of quarters? Um, German uh, uh, bishops and princes are most adamant about the need for a council. Of course, that also reinforces the papacy's own concerns that a council might um, unleash um, elements that uh, they would want to control instead. Nonetheless, the council is called, and the council, by all historical accounts, is a great success, um, at least in the eyes of the Roman Catholic institution. Uh, it focuses on um, a whole variety of institutional reforms. So um, it uh, uh, firmly uh, underlines and reinforces a canonical requirement that bishops have to live in their own sees or dioceses. There have been a tremendous problem of absentee bishops uh, throughout the church, and this is really clamped down upon and really uh, ceases to be a problem after this council. Uh, there's a condemnation of pluralism, the holding of multiple church offices, so you could be... Uh, a bishop in one place, an archbishop in another, and, and an abbot of a monastery yet again. And that is all really, for the most part, eliminated as a result of this council. So two significant pastoral issues of the presence of bishops um, not exercising their pastoral and teaching duties within diocese is effectively dealt with at this council. There's a regulation on the sale of indulgences and relics, which was really one of the big areas of critique by people not just Martin Luther, but also internal reformers like Erasmus. The Council of Trent also sees the establishment of seminaries for the training of clergy. Up to this point in time, the training of clergy is really quite ad hoc, very much on the job training in many ways. And so there's a formalization of the training process into seminaries so that uniform um, education occurs. So for those of you who are in seminary now, you can thank the Council of Trent for being there. But there's also an, a rejection of attempt to decentralize church authority, to devolve some authority down to uh, bishops or to insert any other authority of councils. Uh, instead, uh, papal authority is reasserted and centralized. So those are some really effective um, institutional reforms uh, that occur here. Alongside of these institutional reforms, there are a number of 
uh, theological statements um, and clarifications that are made in response to Protestantism. Uh, three uh, major areas here are uh, questions of authority, uh, questions about the nature of sacraments, and of course, the question of the doctrine of justification. So let's uh, review these. Regarding uh, authority in the church, remember that one of the driving aspects of Protestant reform movement is this notion of sola scriptura, that it is only the teaching authority of the Bible that ought to be definitive in the life of the church. And this applies in varying degrees within Protestantism, where you have some like uh, a Zwingli or a certain Anabaptist who say that if something does not appear in the Bible, one maybe ought not to uh, engage in that sort of church practice or teaching anymore to more nuanced perspectives that you find in a person like a Luther or um, certain Anglican thinkers. The Council of Trent responds by saying that um, it really tries to address this question of traditions and teachings that, uh, that are developed outside of the period of the formation of scriptures. So they want to argue that tradition of the church has a sort of authority parallel to scripture. That is that um, truth and discipline are conveyed both by written book, books, scripture, and by the unwritten traditions of the church. And so they uh, develop a concept around the magisterium which is Latin for teaching tradition. So the magisterium, or the church's teaching tradition, is the final arbiter regarding questions of uh, validity of church traditions or of interpretations of scripture. So to clarify this a little bit more, Protestantism wants to say that scripture is the basis upon which activity of the church ought to be interpreted through. Scripture norms the life of the church. The Council of Trent and the Roman Catholic uh, uh, position here is actually the church is the interpreter of scripture. That's the church that has actually defined what the canon is and so is the competent body to interpret the meaning of scripture and to develop traditions that are in accordance with Scripture. So now we have two different ecclesiologies here. One is church shaped by Scripture, which is Protestantism, or the other is this Catholic position of church and Scripture in a dynamic and mutually reinforcing relationship to each other. Alongside all of this, uh, the Council of Trent affirms that the Vulgate Bible, that is this translation of the Bible into Latin, is the authoritative edition of Scripture for all issues of dogma, all issues of doctrine, and that one ought not to interpret Scripture contrary to church teaching. That is to say, well, I have this better translation of the Bible, and based on this translation of the Bible, I reinterpret your church's teaching in areas like justification. So this whole question of going back to the original text, translating it out um, into the vernacular, and then developing a theological system out of it, which is what we see happening in people like a Luther or a Zwingli or a Calvin, the Council of Trent is rejecting and saying, no, there is a longer teaching tradition based on the Vulgate that is what is authoritative for all church teaching. So this is really an, a reassertion of a traditional uh, position in the life of the uh, Church of Rome. The second area that I mentioned was around sacraments. So we know that Protestantism is redefining sacraments down to um, two, generally, baptism and uh, communion. And the Roman Catholic Church reasserts in the Council of Trent that there are seven sacraments. Now, it's important to know that the teaching of seven sacraments um, is very new, actually, relatively in the life of the Church. It only emerges in the late medieval period. And there's, there has been some proposals that there's five sacraments, 
or nine sacraments or 12 sacraments. And here, seven sacraments is made the normative and definitive number via the Council of Trent. So they are baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, reconciliation, that's what we would understand as confession and penance, uh, extreme unction, that is anointing of those who are dying, also sometimes called last rites, holy orders, and matrimony. The argument is that grace is conveyed via the administration of the sacraments. So a rejection of the Protestant teaching that grace is conveyed by God alone, but rather here that grace is also conveyed through the sacraments of the church. And so this opposition to a notion that sacraments can only testify to faith, this goes back to say Zwingli's memorialist understanding of the Lord's Supper, where one perceives um, Christ's presence at the Lord's Supper based on the faith that one has. No, rather, the Council of Trent wants to teach in its decree on sacraments that Christ is always present um, at the celebration of the Mass, and that it, Christ is always graciously present there to all who will receive it, who um, live within the grace of the Church. Regarding Eucharist in particular, uh, there's a decree issued concerning the sacrifice of the Mass, which affirms a traditional understanding that the Mass is a uh, perpetual sacrifice that's efficacious as an oblation or an offering. And it's also a propitiation for the living and the dead. That is, uh, the offering of the Mass is a reenactment of Christ's sacrifice on the cross that in its offering does something for those who live now and for those who are dead. That it can be applied graciously to affect one's um, status in the eyes of God. So this obviously looks very different than our various Protestant notions of the Eucharist that we have been examining. And finally, when we get to the question of justification, um, uh, there's certain decrees on justification that are if issued. There's a decree on justification, then there's a set of canons on justification that are issued. We begin with a presupposition that no salvation exists outside of Christ, and Christ can only be found within the life of the church. One becomes justified via a process of God's grace working through the person of Jesus Christ. And that all people have free will to cooperate with this divine grace. The question is how this collaboration occurs. And there's a notion that there is a voluntary reception of grace. That is that the human person in the life of the church, can choose to receive the grace that is offered to one. And this grace is understood to occur via an infusion of charity or the infusion of God's love within the person. So I want to read from the decree and justification from Mark Knoll's book, The uh, Confessions and Catechisms of the Reformation, this is chapter 7 of those decrees. Um, the pagination is the middle of page 177. So it says, For although no one can be just, except he to whom the merits of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ are communicated, so w it, there's an agreement with a Protestant position that it is uniquely in the, the death of, of Jesus Christ that one is justified. It goes on to say, yet this takes place in that justification of the sinner when by the merit of the most holy passion the charity of God is poured forth by the Holy Ghost in the hearts of those who are justified and inheres in them. So the idea here is, is if one's baptized and then participating in the life of the church 
that one has the grace of God infused into them by the Holy Spirit that is testifying to the merits of Christ that can redeem them. So what happens then? Whence a man or a person through Jesus Christ in whom that one is engrafted, that is, has been baptized into Christ, receives in that justif justification together with the remission of sins all these infused at the same time, namely faith, hope, and charity. So what's being said here is that if one is in Christ through baptism, then one has had supernaturally infused into them these core Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity, which means then that the Christian is always in a place to be able to have their will cooperate with God's will to move towards justification. So this is a rejection of the Protestant notion of justification by faith alone, where one is turned towards God by God's work alone, by the activity of the preaching of the gospel. So the idea in Protestantism is one can live one's whole life nominally as a Christian, but never be actually converted to Christ except by uh, God's own work. Here it's saying if one's brought into the life of the church, one is in Christ, and one's will can begin to be graciously drawn further and further into God, that one can cooperate with God. So the question here is, can the will cooperate with grace? Protestantism says, by and large, no. Uh, at least in this point in time, we'll get to later debates that revise that question. Whereas the Roman Catholic answer is, yes, it can if one is already in Christ through baptism. That really sets up a stark difference. And we can go back to looking at Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises, for instance, as, again, this example of how nature and grace can cooperate. So that really sets out some stark dividing lines now between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. The Council of Trent, as I've said before, is uh, hugely influential and very successful. One of the markers of this is um, the promulgation of the profession of the Tridentine faith in 1564. Tridentine is our adjectival form for Trent, where this council occurred. And this is a new sort of um, affirmation of faith that Roman Catholics are expected to be able to um, affirm much as these various confessions and catechisms we've seen produced by Protestants, adherence to those traditions are now being expected to affirm. So this uh, profession, the Tridentine faith, sets out three things. One, an allegiance to apostolic and ecclesiastical traditions as the Council of Trent has defined them. An affirmation uh, that all scriptural interpretation has to adhere to the existing norms of the church. So that's uh, setting aside a, a Protestant interpretations of Scripture that are in conflict. And then affirming the primacy of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. That the Pope is the unique um, representative of the Church on Earth. And the Roman Catholic Church is the only legitimate Church to exist. So that promulgation of this profession, the Tridentine faith, really marks the beginning of Roman Catholicism as a denominational entity distinct from Protestantism. So Roman Catholics don't exist in 1450, but they do exist in 1565. Uh, before then, you were just part of this one church, but now as the church has splintered, you have to now align yourself with what group you belong to. This period after the Council of Trent um, in the second half of the 16th century and early 17th century is a really um, amazing time of flourishing for Roman Catholicism. We see a, a huge growth in scholarship, education, moral reform, spiritual vitality. So this whole argument, again, from Protestantism that Luther and others come along uh, to save poor Christians from the corruption of the, Roman, of the Catholic Church is really simply wrong because the evidence is, is that within Roman Catholicism, real vitality is there and continues to emerge even after Protestantism. 
we see a real increase in uh, clerical morality, uh, lower cases of um, discipline of clergy after this period of time. Uh, and um, an observation here, as I was saying in our previous video around the Society of Jesus, that reform now has to happen in Roman Catholicism, but it's reform of the person. The church is transformed by having leadership that is pure and godly. And so it's not a reform of, of it's not a restructuring of institution, it's not a changing of doctrine, it's a change of person that leads to a vitality of the church. Despite all these successes, though, it's still the case that uh, the Roman Catholic Church is unable to heal its divisions with Lutheranism and other Protestant movements. So while it's a success internally, externally, um, it's a marker of the deepening divisions within European Christianity. When we uh, uh, get on to our next video, we'll be looking at global Catholic mission with a particular focus on Latin America and to see how this vision of Catholicism is now being spread globally.